Good evening. Welcome to our church service tonight. Let's stand and turn to hymn number 16. I worship you, almighty God. It's a chorus. We'll sing it through two times, okay? Welcome to everybody tonight, uh, and I hope you had a nice afternoon. I was busy uh, picking up hickory nuts in my backyard, so I <laughs> uh, enjoyed being outside. I, I, my wife and I have a little bit of a difference. She likes it cooler. I like it warmer. I liked today. It was a good day. <laughs> Let's open in a word of prayer, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to assemble tonight. We look forward to the message that uh, you've uh, prepared through Pastor Lewis for us. We just would ask that you'd uh, watch over and guide us. We think of our deacon board and the many decisions that they have to make and uh, in the uh, finding of a pastor for us, and we would ask that you would guide and direct them and that you would guide and direct us. That when uh, a man is brought forth and he's the right one, that we would know and, and we would uh, just... Uh, act accordingly. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Okay, looking at uh, things here, uh, our next hymn is Thou Art Worthy, number 23, and I'll let you uh, remain seated for that one. And since this is a chorus, we'll do through this, this one through twice, too. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, oh, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power, for thou 
for announcements this evening. Uh, a reminder to the youth of the Harvest Fest coming up on the 30th of September and the need to sign up out in the foyer. And looking ahead, Mountain Toppers have an activity on the 21st of October and the Justified Gospel Quartet will be with us on the 22nd of October. So some things to look forward to. There's the regular uh, things that go on during the week in the bulletin. Please take a look at those yourself and uh, be there if, if uh, you're moved to. Uh, could we have the ushers come forward for our uh, offering? Sid, would you offer her thanks? his eyes on the sparrow? Yes. That's what I thought. Great. For our hymn before the message, uh, let's stand and turn to hymn number 83, Be Thou My Vision.
one last announcement there will be a short business meeting after the message tonight I thought he was going to say there'll be a short message tonight <laughs> so how do you know how do you know I I never know uh, how many of you have ever had the nose itch you know anybody other than me I'll tell you the truth I don't know what it is. We got a bad case of it tonight. If you saw, if you see me over here like this, it's uh, just scratching my nose. I had a secretary a number of years ago when I was pastoring on Guam. She was from Charleston, South Carolina, and she fit the bill. She had that Charleston accent, and she was really gullible. Her name is Linda, Linda McGinnis. Her husband was a navigator on a B-52 bomber flying out of Guam, and a wonderful secretary. But I could, I could play tricks on her. And on a Sunday night, my nose is itching like it is now. And I said something about it in the service. And the next day, it's still itching. So I'm scratching it. I walked out of my office. And her desk was right next to it. And I said, Linda, would you call the drugstore and see if they've got any nose itch? <laughs> she said, nose itch? I said, yeah, I usually get it at the drugstore. She picks up the phone and looks up the number, calls them. Yes, do you all have any nose itch? And she heard me laughing. She says, never mind, never mind, and hung up. But uh, that was when I was younger and meaner. But uh, anyway, I do have the nose itch. I wanted to ask a question this morning when the announcements were given, and then I forgot about it, and our brother made another mention of it. What are the mountain toppers? Who are they? What is it? Seniors. Oh, I'll keep that in mind. When I get old enough to join the seniors, buddy, I'll, I'll be a mountain topper for sure, okay? All righty. It's interesting some of the names that are given uh, to senior saints. And uh, none of them are supposed to imply old, so you have to get the right combination. All right, turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Psalm of David. I'll be respectful of your time tonight because I do know that you have a, a business meeting and uh, I will bear that in mind as we uh, go through this. Psalm 103, our text, what we've chosen for our text tonight is beginning in verse 8 and we'll go down through verse 18. The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. In other words, he hasn't given us what we deserve. Verse 11, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. If you mark your Bible and you don't have verse 11 marked in it, that would be a good verse to mark. I like marking my Bible so that when I open it up, I can find things that have spoken to me in, in the past. And uh, I, was some, I was telling somebody today, it's a trauma to me to change Bibles, to wear one out and have to change. Because after you've had it for several years, it takes on your personality somewhat, and you go back and you, can, you, you just get a great blessing from an old Bible that is an expression of the things that God has taught you and worked with you in your heart about. So as for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy. That verse doesn't end there. It goes on to say, great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. I love that verse, verse 12. You know, sometimes when God saves us, we have a hard time, you know, with the fact that we're forgiven. But... God says, as far as the east is from the west. In 1981, my wife and I and our two children literally flew around the world. I was preaching a revival. I lived on Guam, and I was preaching a revival meeting in Germany and uh, checked prices and found out it's a lot cheaper to go all the way around than it was to go to Germany. We had to go to come back to the mainland during the summer. And... Uh, it was interesting, we left Guam and we went west. And we didn't turn around. 
We just kept going and we came back to Guam. We didn't have to turn around. God says he separates our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's infinitely separates them from us. And I like that. Verse 13, like as a father pitieth or has compassion on his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he knows what we're made out of, he knows the real you. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. In verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Did you notice a word that kept popping up in the verses that I read? What was it? What? Mercy. Mercy. Okay. Another word that kept popping up. That got, what somebody said? Fear. Did you notice as we read fear that the, the promises of God, things that God, God says, hinged on our having a holy, reverential awe, fear of a holy God? He doesn't promise. In verse 11, he says, For heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Mercy attached to our having a proper relationship and respect for a holy God. And so we look at that. Verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them or has compassion on them that fear him. The two, hand in hand. And you have a fear, an awe of God, a respect of God, then God says, I'll have compassion on you. Verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him. The mercy of the Lord, change it here, based on us having a fear of a holy God. You know, sometimes we, well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into it here. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of preaching your word. We thank you that it's so clear here, Lord, that we need to have a holy fear of you. Not that we quake and tremble, and, but we have to, ought to have a reverence and an awe of our holy God and a fear when we try to stray from you and the path you have for us. So tonight I pray that you would impress upon our hearts the need to have a holy fear and awe of our God, and then we claim the blessings that you promise. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I believe that all of the people that make these telemarketing calls have me on their Rolodex. Uh, I think it's safe to say that on our house line, our home line, not our cell phones, but on our house phone, that three-fourths of all the calls we get are somebody trying to sell us something or telling us we won something uh, or wanting us to give to something. And uh, I, get, I get really tired of it. But usually when they're telling you, when somebody tells you they're going to give you something free, look out. Because when they tell you they're going to give you something free, they've usually got their arm in your pocket up to their elbow already. They're wanting something from you. And uh, I remember one time, uh, I do the grocery shopping at my house because my wife with her Parkinson's is not able to do it and she doesn't drive. So she'll give me a list and I'll go to the grocery store and be tooling around there. Well, I've started being a, a good shopper. I look for uh, coupons and all this kind of stuff. I figure if I save a buck, you know, that's a buck earned. So one day when I first started doing, started doing this, we had to buy some Splendid. And they had a, a deal on it. I saw this coupon, and it was $4 off. I was proud of me. I'd save $4. Man, that's enough for a McFlurry. And uh, so I unload my basket. I've got $4 coming, or at least off. She tallied the thing up. Got any coupons? Yes, ma'am. I've got this one. 
I handed it to her just waiting for her to knock the $4 off of my bill. She looked at that thing. She said, oh, I'm sorry. I knew I was in trouble. She said, it's expired. It's, it's, it's no good. I'm sorry. Now, so I walked out $4 poorer than I thought I was going to do. And uh, I didn't get it. But that's been the story of my life. Oftentimes, when somebody tells you they're going to give you a deal or something, uh, it doesn't turn out exactly the way you expected it to. Uh, you get a call from somebody and telling you won some kind of sweepstakes that you never entered in. And if you'll just send a certain amount of money, you'll get a whole lot more. There are actually people in this world crazy enough to do that. But uh, at least at this point, the stage in my life, I'm not, I'm not there. So people have promised you the moon, promise you everything. And oftentimes they don't deliver. But God's promises are sure. And I've known people that wanted to claim the promises of God without attaching it to it, the things that God says are necessary in order to claim the promise. God, in this uh, wonderful psalm, Psalm 103 is a wonderful, wonderful psalm. You say, well, preacher, you can say that about all 150 of them. That's true. But we're in 103 tonight. And I know it's a wonderful psalm, and we just see the heart of David in this. And David's a man after God's own heart. You see it popping out in this, in this psalm. So when we walk in the fear of God, as David admonishes us and reminders that David is not speaking as you and I are chatting in the vestibule or something. David is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, directing his lips to say the right thing. And so when we, what David is telling us here, when we walk in the fear of the Lord, we're uh, really granted access to the promises of God. It's like the key that unlocks the door. And so we need to, we need to take a look. In this matter of fearing God, I uh, some of the greatest times I have ever had in my life is doing things with my family. I enjoy my family. Pastoring many times it, it demanded things, and you'd have to leave a certain thing. You'd have plans, and there'd be a, a death in the church, or there'd be a sickness, and it would call you away. And we missed a lot of things, but we uh, we have some wonderful times and. When we get together, when my children are home and my grandchildren, oftentimes our conversations are about wonderful times that we've had in our, in our lives, whether it was on a vacation or something funny that, that happened. Uh, wonderful memories. But if you talk to my children, they would say, you know what, we, we boy, when, when Dad spoke, we knew he meant business. We knew that when Dad said don't, he meant don't. But my kids today, I think... No, and knew back then that I loved them. I know that my God loves me. But I want to meet the conditions to get the blessings that God and the promises that God has made to me and to you. What God calls us to do to meet the conditions, the conditions that are impossible to meet in our own strength. But by the grace of God, we can. We can have His promises are unshakable and sure. Paul says in Romans chapter 4 and verses 20 and 21, and it was mentioned in Sunday school this morning, he staggered, talking about Abraham, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Abraham had faith in God. He believed in the promises of God, and it was a source of strength to him as he faced many, faced many, many challenges. And you've read about those. You know what I'm talking about. But yet, there are a lot of folks that have no fear of God. Our society has lost any fear of God. And I believe that that's one reason we're in the mess we're in as a nation is because we've lost the fear and the awe of God. Those that have no fear of God are really graphically portrayed in Romans chapter 3, where we start the Romans road. If you look, turn there with me, if you will, please. We won't take long there, but you kind of get the picture of it. Romans chapter 3 and verse 12. Paul writing there, he says, 
First of all, in verse 10, he says, that is, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become un unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. In other words, what Paul is describing there in that verse, or verse uh, 12, is a, a useless life, useless to God, because it's not yielded to God. He goes on and describes the situation in verse 13. He says, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit, and the poison of asp is under their lips. They have deceiving tongues. They've got poisonous lips. The words that come from their mouth are not words that uh, encourage and not words that lift up, but that drag down. Verse 14 talks about bitter words whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. The most miserable people I know in life are bitter people. Now, let me tell you something about bitterness. You know who bitterness hurts the most? The one that's bitter. It is a cancer that will destroy you. That's what Paul is describing in his day. That was the conditions that he saw. He's not painting a very pretty picture of man. Bitter words. Verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Wow. Uh, violence is a part of their life. Verse 16. Destruction and misery are in their way. You can underline that word misery. You get all of these things together, you've got some real misery. Verse 16. Miserable days. And verse 17 tells you the summation of it. And the way of peace have they not known. Just a constant strife, bickering, the joy is gone, and it'll destroy you. It'll destroy you. So I want us to look in the time that we have. God says that we ought to fear Him. I believe if we have a fear of God, that what Paul has described in Romans chapter 3 will not be a part of our life. Well, now, we may be guilty of some of these things, some of the time, but that will not be our practice. It won't be where we live because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We'll want our lives to be different. We'll want to honor the Lord. And so, those who fear the Lord will, will approach Him in awe. They'll submit to Him. They'll submit to His Word in humility. They'll obey Him with, with vigilance. They'll want to please God. And they'll trust confidently in the promises of His Word. You know, I have had the privilege of meeting with your deacons a couple of times. And I'll tell you something about your deacons. They're good men. They have a heart for God, they have a heart for this church, and they want to do right. And they're absolutely nuts. They pick on each other and tease each other a little bit and break the tension, but they have a heart for God. They have a fear of, of not doing what God tells them to do. I want to tell you something. You, you pray for your deacons, and I know I'm straying a little bit, but you pray for your deacons that God's hand would be on them. I believe it is. As they seek to find the man that God has to lead this church. And I, I say all of that to say, I sense that they have a fear of God, that I'm going to give an account to God for how I conduct myself. And I'll tell you what. I believe that collectively, eight men whose hand God, whose have God's hand on them are a whole lot wiser than this old soul. And so these are men that I believe you can trust, men that uh, just have a heart for God and want to get it right. But let's look and see what the result is if we do have a fear of God. What is it that God tells us in His Word? First of all, and, and I trust that you've got this taken care of, but He saves those that fear Him, that do what God says on this matter of salvation, put their faith and trust in Him. Psalm 85 and verse 9, the psalmist says, Surely His salvation is nigh them that fear Him, that glory may dwell in our land. He'll save you if you put your faith and trust in Him. If you have enough fear that you'd say, God, I'm not worthy but I confess my sin and ask you to come into my heart and save me. So that's the first one. Usually on your Sunday night crowd, that's pretty well uh, taken care of. But we also see something else. Uh, if we have a fear of God, if we fear Him, then He'll save us. 
But we also see that He pours out His love and mercy on those that fear Him. Look at verses 11 and 17 again. For as the heaven is high above the earth, great is His mercy toward them that fear Him. What is mercy? What is the difference between mercy and grace? Help me out. Right. And grace is... And, and merit in favor. Getting, when God gives you something you don't deserve, that's God's grace. If He gave us all what we deserve, we'd all stack up in hell. But by His grace, He saved me. And uh, I, don't worry, I don't spend any time worrying about going to hell because of God's mercy. So our, our psalmist David says, Great is His mercy toward them who fear Him. Verse 17, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. It, there's no, uh, you can't exhaust it. You cannot consume all of God's mercy. There's no shortage. I can remember as a, as a little boy, there were seven of us, seven children, my mom and my dad, and my mother had a big old black pan that she would cook biscuits in. She always, with that many people, she'd always cook it, as many biscuits as she could get in it. There was never a half a pan. It was always a full pan. But we, you know, we didn't get fancy. We didn't put the bread in a basket or anything. My mother would sit that pan on the table and we would eat biscuits. And you could kind of keep your eye on it. And as the, the number of biscuits in that pan got uh, diminished and... I don't know that any of the rest of my brothers and sisters did it, but I'd eat my biscuits faster. I, I wanted to eat them faster so I could get another one. Because I don't remember growing up that there was ever a leftover biscuit at my, mother, at my mother's table, ever. And so I just, I'd eat fast, and I, I learned how to, my mother used to say, don't gobble your food down. But mama, there's only four more biscuits, and I want one of them. I didn't say that, or I wouldn't have gotten one. But we don't have to gobble up mercy, folks. God's not going to run out of it, but I want it. I want God's mercy on my life. And here, David, David, a man that knew what it was to have God's mercy on his life. man that God said that he was a man after his own heart. David, David wanted God's mercy, God's loving kindness. And God knows how needy and how, how desperate we are. God knows your needs. I don't always know. Matter of fact, to be quite honest with you, sometimes I don't know what I need. I just don't. But God does. And He's promised to meet my needs according to His riches and glory. But He's put a little stipulation on that. I, I've got to fear Him. I've got to reverence Him. To hold Him in awe. So he knows how needy we are. But God loves us so much that he takes all those that fear him and pours out his mercy on them. And we can run to him and find in him a tender heart toward those that trust him enough to come to him. Cast your cares on him, for he careth for you, the scriptures tell us. Psalm 55 and verse 22, Cast thy burdens upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Over and over we find God's promises that He'll meet our needs, that He'll take care of us. The book of Lamentation in chapter 3 and verse 22 and 23, the Scripture says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We sing that old wonderful hymn sometimes. I'm sure you've, you do it here. Great is thy faithfulness. That's where it comes from. Great is thy faithfulness. We need, to be, we need to be reminded, we need to know that God is faithful to us. Oh, I know that. We know it, but oftentimes we act like we don't know it. We act like it's, it's something strange to us. We act like we know better than God. So we see that He saves those that fear Him. He pours out His love and mercy on those that fear Him. Then we see that it has compassion on those that fear Him. Look at verses 13 and 14 of our text. 
Like as a father pitieth or has compassion on his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we're dust. God's not surprised by anything in our lives. It's not like, you know, have, have you ever... I got a ticket one time. I know, I know, I'm not supposed to. But I lived in a little community on a little island, and so people knew you, and they, my picture was in the newspaper every day. I mean, on the seventh page of the newspaper, I had a little article that appeared every day. So... They may not have known me personally, but most people on the island of Guam knew me by the, that picture. They ever read the newspaper. And one day I was in a hurry. And I was speeding. Don't tell anybody. Let's keep this between us, okay? So the policeman lifts on that blue light, and I knew I'd been had. I pulled over. Let me see your driver's license, registration. I hadn't even looked at him. I reached, I got it, and when I turned around to hand it to him, oh, Pastor Lewis, I didn't know that was you. Now, what do you think the right thing to have done would be? You know what I did? I thought I was insane. I said, you know, I was speeding. Give me the ticket. I did not want to use my position as a pastor. I had a good relationship with the police department there. I'd go to the jails, and we had a jail ministry and things, and I didn't want to be known as the preacher that used his position to further himself. Just didn't. I don't want to make excuses. And I don't want to think that somehow that I'm some, something special. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And uh, I don't deserve God's tender mercies. Yet he says he pities us. He has compassion on us. It's one thing to have God's compassion and God's pity. It's another to use your position. Take advantage. I don't deserve the love of God. That's not something I can earn. It was freely given to me. And we look and we see that not only does He save us, He pours out His love toward us, He has compassion on those that fear Him. And just in case, He stores up His goodness for those that fear Him. Look at Psalm 31 and verse 19. Turn there with me, if you will, please. Psalm 31 and verse 19. A wise old preacher told me shortly after I got saved, he said, and I was a young man then, studying for the ministry, and I was sitting in his class on systematic theology, and he said, men, he said, the older you get, the more you're going to like the book of Psalms. And I thought, okay. Okay. He's in his 90s now. He's pushing 100. He's still alive. He lives down in Georgia. I'd like to go see him one day and say, you know what, Doc, you were right. Because the older I get, the more I love the Psalms. And I love Psalm 31 and verse 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. There's a storehouse. There's a storehouse that God has. We're told in this verse, his goodness, he stored it up. He's not going to run out. He's laid it up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. God's goodness is inexhaustible. And those who believe the biblical revelation of God will gladly acknowledge that he is good and that all he does is good. Even when we think it's bad, even when God lets things happen in our life when our health fails or this happens or that happens. We lose the loved one. God is still good. God is too holy not to be good. He's too righteous not to be good. And so, 
When you get a situation, you can't sort it out. You just have to go by faith and say, I know, I know my God. And I know that He's too good to be unkind. He's too good to withhold what's best for me if I meet the conditions. Sometimes we see this, see God in a strange way. He's, he's a crutch to some. They're not interested in Him until they have a crisis. They love to claim certain promises of God without the things that are necessary to claim those promises. But I like the fact that my God's promise is assured and steadfast. So He stores up His blessings for us, His promises, His provision. Then we see the fifth thing, he makes sufficient provision for those that fear him. We had you back in Psalm 39. Look at Psalm 34 and verses 9 and 10. David said, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. We say we believe the Word of God. And we look at these verses and, you know, we say, okay, this is a promise that God's made. There's no want. That word want, if you go back and you look at it in the Hebrew, there's no lack. There's, there's nothing lacking that we really need. We sometimes think we need this and we need that. God knows exactly what we need. And I've lived long enough to know that some of the things that I thought I really need, needed, God in His infinite wisdom said no, and I didn't get them. And I'm better off because God said no. There's no want to them that fear Him. You see, if you fear Him, you'll only want the things He wants you to have. You'll only want the things that are best for you. You won't want you know, uh, the boat that's going to keep you out of church on Sunday because you've got to be out on the lake. Now, if you've got a boat, that doesn't mean it's wrong to have a boat. But if that boat, that cottage, whatever it is, if it keeps you out of uh, church, if it keeps you from serving God, then it's wrong for you. It may be all right for your neighbor. Your neighbor, neighbor may be able to handle it in such a way it's not a problem with it. But anything that comes between you and your God, it, it has become your God. But God hasn't shortchanged you. He just hasn't. When I came to Michigan, first time we had a family that had a need in the church, I had a deacon's meeting scheduled and the family had, had a need and it was a legitimate need. And I was a new guy on the block. And I said, fellas, tell me, I said, there's a family that has some financial needs and I think we need to help, but where is that covered in the budget? How, how do you all handle that? They said, well, preacher, it's not in the budget. And he said, uh, the chairman of the deacons, some of you know Doug DeVore, went to be with the Lord a few years ago, a wonderful man, good friend. Doug said, Pastor, he said, we, uh, we don't have it in the budget or anything. He said, we call it the deacons fund. I said, why do you call it the deacons fund? He said, when there's a need, we pass the hat in the deacons meeting. Don't elect me a deacon. If you get a good, big church and faith was running 500 or so, and uh, I thought, wow. I said, well, what do you do with the Wednesday night offering? They said, we don't take a Wednesday night offering. I said, I'm a Baptist. Let's start taking one. I don't want people to forget how to give between Wednesday and Sunday. And so we did. We started that. And it's worked very, very well. It always have, there's never been a shortage. After we build up a little bit of money in it, there's never been a shortage. Been able to take care of the needs. But I found something out. I remember getting it up in the first year to where we had $10,000 in a benevolent fund. Somebody came in, they had a need, with deacons or pastoral staff would take a look at it and we'd help. 
But I noticed a trend. There was a trend of a few families that thought it was their own personal rainy day fund. You know, we can live recklessly and, uh, you know, the church is going to bail me out. So I remember a lady coming in and just weeping. Don't have, don't have any money to buy groceries or anything. Have, have no money and I don't know where we're going get, to get enough food to eat. This was before we started a food pantry. And I said, okay, I said, and this was not our first time in. I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll either have a deacon's wife or a pastoral staff member's wife will go with you to the grocery store and you can spend $750. That's a lot of groceries, folks. That's a lot of groceries. I said, you can spend up to $750, but you have to go with somebody because I didn't want them buying junk. They went, they spent $749 in some sense. It didn't make any difference. That's exactly right. $750, no problem. Just a few days later, within, I'm talking about within a month, we had what they call the Faith Family, uh, or the fun, not fun festival, I can't even think of the name of it, but it's a fundraiser for the school. And uh, they have an auction. They had an auctioneer, and I, I love to hear an auctioneer, but this guy's great. He's a Christian and a godly man, so we had an auction. And I always said, I'm going to spend $200 at, at this fundraiser, I told my wife, if we don't, you know, if we don't see something we need, we'll get something for somebody else. But we need to show that we're supportive of the school. And so they had a small little, uh, uh, what do you call it, those uh, battery-operated cars. And I, my grandchildren were small enough at the time, I thought, I know they'd enjoy that, and their grandfather would enjoy it too. And if I got it, I could, let, I could play with it under the pretense of showing them how. So there was a doctor standing off to my right, and I'm there, and we started bidding on that thing, and I'm up close to the front, so I can't see anybody but this doctor. But we go back and forth, and the third person that's bidding is behind us, and I didn't want to look at him because I was afraid the price would go up. So the doctor dropped out. We were up to about $150, and I saw the thing at Costco. I could have gotten it for $100. And so we back and forth, back and forth, and I thought, I gotta see who that is that's bidding against me. I may go broke. My wife is standing right beside me, and uh, I looked around, and it was the husband of this woman that we'd given seven hundred and fifty dollars, and he's outbidding me. I leaned over to my wife. I said, "He ain't getting it." I said, "We may go broke tonight, but he's not gonna get that car." So I bid, and I got it for about two hundred dollars, which I had planned on spending anyway. And when I go over to pay the bill, the guy comes up to me with his long, long, sour looking face. And he said, Pastor Lewis, he said, my boys are not very happy with you. I said, what do you mean? He said, they really had their hearts set on that truck. It was a truck, not a car. I said, they ain't going to get it. They're not getting it. I didn't give it to my grandkids. I gave it to somebody else. They wouldn't have had the money to buy it. You know, they didn't need that truck. I didn't need it either. And I was determined they weren't going to get it. They didn't. You say, well, preacher, that's, that's mean. Sometimes God says no to us. Because we're being dumb. And God loves us too much to let us go off the deep end, wreck our lives, our church, and everything that's important. God says, no. No, you're not going to do it. And just as, you know, my parents or I as a parent had ways of saying no to my children to get the point across, God can get the point across to you. He makes sufficient provision for you. He takes care of you. He wants your best. But sometimes He says no. We see another what he delights in those who fear him. Psalm 147, verse 11, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. 
Again, it's more than what we think of as fear. It's a, a, a reverence, a holding of a holy God and all. And God delights in that. All right. Break it down this way. To delight in something is to be happy about it. Is that not so? You realize, do you realize when we fear God that God is happy about it? He delights in it. He rejoices in it. We see something else. We alluded to it a little bit this morning. But he confides in those who fear him. Psalm 25 and verse 14 says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. You know, when we have a holy fear of God and a reverence for God, so how does God, how does God confide in us? The secrets of the Lord is with them that fear him? Isn't it amazing when our hearts are in tune with God how this book comes alive? How we understand it and how it, it, it makes sense, verses and, and things that maybe we'd read a hundred times. And all of a sudden, God opens our eyes in such a way that we can see truth that our eyes were blinded to. You ever had a best friend? Somebody that you could talk to about anything and everything? Well, you got a friend that's sticking closer, closer than a brother in the Lord. And he says, I'll confide in you. I'll let you in on the innermost secrets of my word, if you just fear me, if you just reverence me. Folks, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing to fear God. If we have a holy fear of a holy God, we'll want to do what God wants us to do. It won't be my will, but thy will. We want to do what God wants us to do. We want our lives to make a difference for the cause of Christ. God wants to pour out His blessings on you as an individual. It's not like, you know, the... TV evangelists that tell you, you know, send $100 in, God will multiply it a thousand times and you'll be rich. That's not it. That's not it. Sometimes it's God saying, I love you so much that I'm going to let you go through this valley, this trial, because it'll make you better and not bitter. Do you have a fear of God? A holy fear of reverence for God? If you don't, you need it. If you don't, you'll wind up, when things don't go your way, you'll get bitter and angry and mean and nasty. And it'll destroy you. It'll destroy you. Let's have a holy fear of a holy God. Heavenly Father, your word says, great is your mercy, great is your mercy toward them that fear you. Lord, help us to have a holy fear of our holy God. Lord, a, a desire to please you in everything that we do and all of you and who you are. And Lord, when we have that, we know that we can claim your promises and know that you'll fulfill them. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you that your promises are sure. Let us have the fear that we need to claim those promises and make a difference for the cause of Christ. We will thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What are we singing? Hymn number 436. Hymn number 436. Where, he leads, Where he leads me, I'll follow. As we stand, we'll sing one verse. God's spoken to your heart. I encourage you to come.